Hi, welcome. Um, I'm McLemon. You can find me on the interwebs and on the most comfy Mastodon instance in the Fediverse as well. If you want to live toot or tweet about this talk, uh, I have no idea what the official hashtag is. So the organizers don't know as well. Just use whatever you like. Um, this is uh, about backups um, occasionally. Um, who of you does backups? Show of hands. Okay, that's about a third, roughly. Um, okay, so what do we want? We want we want a good feeling, yeah. Um, that warm, fuzzy feeling when you lose data. When do we want that? Right after the anxiety that you've built up during the event uh, has calmed down and starts to fade. So what? does backup even mean, actually? Trying to find, find some meaning into that. Um, to backup someone means to support a person or a cause or a community, like this one. Um, your backup, it's that cold, moist feeling crawling up your spine when you find out that you're missing some data somewhere. Um, you back up into... Uh, double flooring in the data center when somebody else finds out that you're missing data. And you're back up on your feet when you manage to get that beta data back for some magical reason. And uh, to back up means going in the reverse or not normal flow or direction. So now that you have a definition of backup, this is a recommendation, you know what to do and what it means, of course. and. This leads us to the uh, ultimate question of backup. How much could you lose? Any idea? For the younger people, this is a punch card. It was used to program computers in the 60s, 70s. Um, this is actually a data medium. It carries 80 bytes. So if you lose that card, you could lose 80 bytes of data or code. Um, you could also lose the metadata because a single card was not used to program. It was a stack of cards. And the metadata is extremely important because the order of the cards matters, especially if you have code. So dropping a stack of cards could mean that you're sitting hours and hours and sorting them manually again. Um, of course, backups have some laws that apply to them. If you know these laws, please, please raise your hand. Um, this should be familiar for everyone. It's Murphy's Law. Um, it says anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Certainly applies to backups. Uh, then, of course, there's Finnegal's Law. The Finnegal's Law of Dynamic Negatives. Sounds encouraging. Uh, it means anything that can go wrong will at the worst possible moment. So usually when you're traveling or at some inconvenient point in time. Uh, and of course, there's Hofstetter's law, the Douglas R. Hofstetter of Gödel Escherbach, the famous book everyone has in the bookshelf to impress their friends, but has, hasn't actually read. Um, and that says it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account Hofstetter's law. This is probably not directly related to backups, but more to the process of data restore, but we'll come to that. So how much could you lose? How much data could you lose? This is a standard audio cassette tape. It was used to give mixtapes to your friends in the 80s uh, to store computer data, of course. Um, these had two sides. You could flip them over after you rewound or fast forwarded the tapes. Uh, one side of 60 minutes could hold 200 kilobytes. If you think about it, an A4 sheet of paper is about two and a half kilobytes, roughly this could be, be your diploma thesis that you lost already. So there's quite something to lose. What's the problem behind all that? Well, um, storage media suddenly decides to refuse to give the data back we stored on it. Of course, we didn't ask it to, but yeah, it doesn't listen to us. Um, and what does data loss mean? Well, your data has gone to the fjords. It's you cannot retrieve it, there's no way to reproduce it, and it's gone with the wind, like punch cards in autumn. They're gone. Um, 
not being able to reproduce data if you have like photos from a trip. Of course, you could go back there again and visit that place, unless it's an island in the Caribbean, and in 10 years, it's probably under the seawater level. Or you've lost a loved one, or the building just is not there anymore. Reality changes our, our surroundings, so you probably cannot reproduce that data in any way. Um, do you know any person who has lost data? Feel free to point a finger at them. Okay, yeah, there's a, quite a lot of finger pointing going on here. Um, yeah, so we're all guilty in losing data. Um, this is a five and a quarter inch floppy. Probably from the early 80s. Um, it could hold around 130 kilobytes, later 160, up to 1.2 megabytes per side. Um, so that's already quite an amount to lose if you lose that floppy. And what is data? Any ideas? Shout it out. Photos? Videos? Text? Other ideas? Some of you may be programming it? Code? Documentation is not a kind of data, it's an illusion. <laughs> Does not really exist. But of course, no byte is illegal and uh, we should take care of them. So what do we need to back up data? We need some classification. Um, of how important or other measures apply to data. Um, another floppy, I'll prom I promise I won't have too many more floppies here. Uh, we already heard there are 130, 160 kilobytes, 1.2 megabytes. How much could you lose? There's a very subtle hint. I'll make it less subtle. Installation media in that time were floppy disks and you had one of six, for example. So if you lost one of them, it was basically striped data over all the floppies. If you lost one, you could not install that software anymore. Um, that one actually contained a backup of Space Quest 3. It's kind of important. So, criteria. Hmm. Keywords for criteria. We need some, yeah, I, I'll give you keywords. Um, we could use the amount of data classify the thing we want to back up. The bigger the data, the longer it takes, of course, yeah. Um, and that's also the very relevant part about the amount. Um, we could classify it by change. How much of our data changes over a certain amount of time? Because that some, somehow ties into how often can we do a backup? Because it takes some time to find out what has changed. And um, also, it does my backup software uh, know how to find that out? Is it capable of doing that, depending on my, the, my stuff? Um, then there's criticality. What's critical data and critical for whom? Um, and for how long is that data critical? At some point, all data is pretty much not important anymore. Um, are your contact information, is your contact information important? Maybe not to yourself, you know your own contact information. Perhaps you know your phone number by heart, still, most don't. Calendar, appointments, your passwords, is that critical data? Maybe. So, okay, last floppy. Um, what's the most important thing you could lose here? I'll zoom in on the relevant part. Of course, you could copy that these games from a friend again. That was pretty common. But what if you lose your high score of that game? That may, may, ta may take a lot of time to reproduce again. Because if you've ever played 80s games, they are hard. They are really hard. So what's relevant to your data? Um, can you recreate it? Perhaps you can, maybe it takes a long time to do so. Um, what problems will I run into when I recreate the data? And what problems do I have while I don't have that data back again? So there's a lot of things that tie into this. Um, what about irrelevant data? That's an interesting thing. Um, I don't mind if I lose it. Caching files, for example, does not really 
pay a lot to restore them from a backup. You could just dump them. It's not important data. Very irrelevant. Or you think more of a somebody else's problem field, a SEP field, and think, well, my VMs are backed up by my hosting provider, unless they're not. And then it's, again, your problem. Yeah. Um, more floppies. I'm always surprised by it. This is an original copy of Microsoft DOS 3.3 with IBM branding. So you're not losing any data by overwriting these because they're original ones. They have a hardware write protection, which is good. But if you punch holes in it and put them into a binder, they might be hard to read. Some people actually did that. And since it's IBM, it probably costs a lot for the license. I've heard they do these things. And uh, you could not download software again when you had distribution via floppies. You could ask for another copy, and you had to pay for that and for shipping and wait for it to arrive. Um, other things we could think about uh, are the duration of your backup. Of course, data does not magically appear somewhere. It has to be copied over and transferred from one storage media to some other media. How long does it take to copy over that? amount. Depends on the amount, depends on the bandwidth you have available. We'll come to that. And also a ton of small files may act differently than a few large files, even if the sum of data is the same. But you have a lot of metadata to handle with files these days, so that might also affect how quickly you can copy things. Uh, of course, the interface you use to transfer, we're now uh, gone uh, and, and escaped the, the realms of narrow SCSI interfaces that were really slow. They were fast back in the day, but now the, and they're not. Um, we're used to having six gigabits a second SATA interfaces on our hard drives, or maybe even an SSD. So that's pretty fast, but it's local. Um, if you have to copy over a network, that's also interesting, getting data off my laptop to some other storage on the network. Um, if you have gigabit Ethernet, that's fine. Unless you have a very slim laptop that does not have Ethernet anymore. Now you're copying over Wi-Fi or a shitty USB adapter that you forgot to take with you. And now you think you have uh, not enough bandwidth to transfer your data or you have a DSL connection in some country with high-speed internet access like Austria, where I'm from. So, yeah. Um, then there's also latency. Latency is the, the time it takes to send a message and get an answer back, like a ping packet, an ICMP packet. Might take a few milliseconds, might take a few more. Some backup software um, really does not like high latency. GSM networks and satellite links, they're high latency links. So they might have quite a nice bandwidth to transfer, but it takes a long time for a message to come back and get, give me an answer, even though I can send pretty fast or can receive pretty fast. Um, there's other kinds of latency. If you think about cloud backups, um, Amazon Glacier, as an example, comes to mind. It's dirt cheap. It's um, pretty much free to dump data in there. You only pay when you restore, which is when you're most vulnerable. And giving latency, um, the official thing is it may take five minutes to 12 hours to actually provide the data for you to download. And that also depends on how much money you throw at it. Um, goes from 0.25 cents to 3 cents per gigabyte, which means a factor of 12. So depending if you really need that data now, um, or if you can wait a little longer, or a few more hours, um, you might shell out a very different amount of money. Um, how much could you lose? It's a three and a half inch floppy, not a quarter, five and a quarter. Um, yeah, it's a safe icon, of course. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it goes from 720 to 800 kilobytes up to 1.44, maybe 2.88 if you, if you had a next station back in the day. Um, so that's already a lot you could lose. Um, do you know where your data is? Any idea? Where's your data? Is it on your laptop? Is it on your NAS at home? Some cloud storage on a server? External hard drives in a cupboard? Some USB stick you've been searching in your couch 
for half a year? Maybe. Um, if you have a phone, a mobile phone, a smartphone with a SIM card, there's probably some phone numbers on there. Who knows? Where's your data? If it's on some DVDs or CDs, that's some Solaris installation media, um, 600 megabytes to 8.5 gigabytes, that's a lot. Do you remember those labels you could print yourself and stick on a uh, DVD you burnt yourself? Ever try to peel one of those off because you made a typo? It's a great idea. You have the silver shiny surface from your DVD that reflects your data on the sticky tape uh, thing now. And your media has unfortunately become unreadable. Um, so, great thing to do. Always label your backups, but please leave them on. Uh, if you have for some reason found out where your data lives at the moment, maybe you should think about where your backups live. Um, local hard drive, external hard drives, that USB stick from the couch you recently found again, um, somewhere over the network, over the internet, um, and how fast is that network? So why not have multiple backups? That sounds like a good idea. Um, and since backup data is in itself data again, backup media dies as well. Hmm. Sad story. And of course, it depends on what your backup media actually is. We already had floppies and hard drives, tapes. Maybe there's tapes to backup data to. Um, tapes. Oh, speaking of tapes. Yeah, that's a DV tape, digital video tape. 3.6 megabytes a second, PAL resolution. There was actually software using that as a backup medium, not for video, but for random data. 17 gigabytes fit onto one of those um, 80 minutes tapes. And you had to re rewind them, of course, it's tape. And since some things are hard to backup, is can you backup data at all? If you carry one of these, like a hardware secure token of some kind, maybe you have an RSA token which generates codes, or one of those keys, or a smart card with your GPG setup. These are very similar to SIM cards in phones. These are not impossible to backup, but usually it's not feasible for the average person to do so. So you might have data that you would like to backup because your keys are important, but there's actually not really a way to do. So how do you deal with that? Maybe get a second of those keys and always uh, plug in both if you use them for a new website to authenticate with a second factor. And now that we've had a lot of media types, there's different kinds of how to back up your data, how to do that, the actual process. There's backup types. That's the easiest one. It's a full backup. You just take a folder, drag it over to your hard drive or to that USB stick and wait for it to copy over. It's kind of opportunistic. It rarely happens. Or usually after you lost something for maybe a few days or weeks, then it starts to fade again. It's also quite a stupid idea because it takes a long time and you copy it over. If you copy it again, it takes the same amount of time or, or maybe a little more because you've added something. Um, and it takes a lot of space. These are funny media. That's a flash card. It's about the size of a credit card. And it carried 10 megabytes. I researched that. It was uh, 8,000 Aust Austrian shillings back then, um, roughly 1990. That's uh, 250,000 Hungarian forint. So can you find a device to actually put that in to copy data off that thing? Mm, maybe hard. How can I access that data? Huh? Then, of course, uh, there's a much more intelligent way to back up your data. It's called incremental. You do one full copy, and then you only do the changes in relation uh, to that copy. Oh, actually, it's uh, since the last update, yeah. And so you have a chain of backup runs, and if you want to restore data, you have to copy the original full backup, and then e apply every change you made. So 
if that's blocks of data, you now have built a blockchain. Um, may take some substantial amount of time to actually get that done. There's other intelligent ways, differential backups. Um, they give you a little more advance regarding the time it takes to restore your data, but you lose some in terms of space that it takes. And of course, that's very convenient, you can com combine those types of backups and most current backup solutions actually apply both principles, meaning you don't only do changes since your last backup and every backup that's stored on your medium can be restored like a full backup as well. Um, many of these uh, tools work by using hard links. If you, anyone know what a hard link to a file is? Okay, there's one person, two persons, three? Oh, getting more. Knowledge is spreading. Awesome. Um, it's easy. If you imagine a file like a dog or any animal person you would put a leash on, uh, one leash is a link. And if you had seven persons who put the leash on the dog, you have now seven leashes, but it's still the same dog. And the same, that same dog will only run away when every leash has been removed. But if somebody comes and eats the dog, they're all gone. I don't know why anyone would do that, but uh, yeah. So these hard links are a funny thing. Most file systems can use them, and most file managers and user interfaces cannot really make any sense of it, meaning you end up with your file manager showing you three times the amount of the actual capacity of your hard drive in use. And it will blow up like that if you copy it over. And some shell tools uh, are nice. They require some flags to actually take that into account, which means they now take a substantial amount of time longer to work, but at least they can accommodate for that. But that's a nice thing to have. We're getting into more modern storage media now. That's a zip drive. Still older than some in the audience, I think. They came in 100 megabytes and 250 megabytes. So, as we see, the more modern the storage media become, the more data we can lose. It's so, they become more efficient in that regard. And of course, there's a very um, widely used type of backup um, that's surprisingly common. It's called a criminal backup. And that is when you occasionally copy something somewhere without any idea. It's, it's, it's enterprise compatible. I've seen it. Um, and then, of course, um, with backup media, there also comes an issue with trust. Who has access to that destination, that storage destination? Um, which software do I need to access it? And what happens if somebody starts being funny with my backup destination? Like, removing hard drives, deleting files there, um, changing data. Does your software notice when data changes in your backup? And will you restore the same things that you actually put there? Or will you restore something different? Hmm. And if something is missing, can you still get at least the remaining parts? Or does your software say, well, this is not what we put there. I'll just refuse to use it at all. Now you have a backup that you lost doesn't serve a lot of purpose. Um, and since we have to update our backups, because we update our data, or somebody else does it for us, um, yeah, that's uh, quite annoying as well. Because what happens when I cannot update my backup at the moment? Like you're sitting on a plane and you have no internet access. Your cloud backup is now pretty useless. It's probably pretty useless anyway, but um, yeah. So hmm. what if you do have a cloud backup, but suddenly that backup provider thinks, oh, I only like enterprise customers and individuals I don't care about. I'll just turn that service off end of next month. This happened so with CrashPlan. They just dropped servicing private individuals and went enterprise only. And now you can't restore that cloud backup that took you three months to get your data up because your DSL connection is slow. Hmm. Kind of annoying. Now you need a new backup solution quickly. 
other storage media. This is a DVD RAM, like a DVD, but you could randomly access the files on it and write to it like through a hard drive, only glacially slow. And they came in these removable caddies and you could actually take the DVD out of that caddy and put it into a DVD ROM drive and read it back. It's a very weird thing. 5.2 gigabytes per side and you could flip them over. Funny thing. Um, oh, the amount of um, per iteration. If you back up and update those backups, how much do you have to back up? How intelligent is your backup software? Uh, why is that relevant, how much changes and how intelligently your software can find out what has changed? Because that gives you a terminal frequency of how often you could actually do a copy of that data. Because you need to find out what has changed. Finding out what has changed takes some time. Either you have to walk a file tree and check the, the timestamps of all the files. If there's a million files on your mailbox, mail server, you now have to compare a million files. That does not go instantly. The actual amount of data, like 27 spam emails you just received, is not a lot to transfer. But finding out which ones, that may take 20 minutes, an hour, sometimes. So even if you don't have a lot of thing to actually copy over, it still may take a lot of time to find out. And there's some redundancy. That's something you cannot get rid of. Um, and also database files. There may be a few things that change, but now you have a several gigabyte database file that's monolithic that you actually have to move over to make sure it's at least somewhat consistent. Um, then there's these wonderful illusions of RAID. People think RAID is a backup. Please repeat after me. A RAID alone is never a backup. It does not matter which level you use. Doesn't ma no, no thing in a RAID is a backup. If you have two RAIDs, you can make one a backup of the other. But a RAID alone is never a backup. Please make that call go through up to marketing, they need to know. Um, why is a RAID not a backup? Because if you have a redundancy of a single hard drive, that's nice. Um, if that hard drive fails, you replace it. And while your RAID is busy copying data over to that new drive, it really hits the other drives hard. And that's when most of the other drives are prone to fail. So now you go with two redundancies and so on. It's not that easy usually. A RAID may reduce your downtime, ideally uh, down to zero. That's a great thing about RAID, um, but it's not a backup in itself because you still have other components that can fail, like the controller. Do you have a backup controller card, like the same RAID controller card from eight years ago with the same firmware version to make sure it can actually read the on-disk format? And you say now, well, I just take out the drives and put it into some other enclosure that's not manufactured anymore. And you have IDE, parallel IDE drives and not any SATA drives that you can actually get drives for or enclosures for anymore. And then they use some proprietary on disk partitioning scheme or something. So that can really go wrong. Speaking of hard drives, how much could you lose? Anyone quick with counting? What's 10 terabyte drives each? It's 280 terabytes you could lose. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, yeah, so that's a lot of data you could lose there. What are the main causes for losing data? Of course, fire, exclamation mark. Um, if your house burns down or your data center burns down for some reason, um, your local backups, meaning your laptop and the hard drive besides it, or your laptop bag in the car, that burns down as well. So, and the RAID, of course, yeah, from your NAS <laughs> at home. Um, I actually got a hard drive from a burnt down car that was in a laptop there. If you ever find yourself in that situation, get a well-ventilated room, some rubber gloves to work on that. It's not funny. Um, do you know what usually comes after a fire? 
Exactly. And the few things that survive the fire will actually drown in the fire extinguishing water. Um, so, floodings do happen. I've seen double flooring in data centers where the water actually came from the bottom. It's probably not the cleanest water as well. Kind of makes you think about, hmm, there's our, my uninterruptible power supplies all at the bottom. Now bubbling with water and large batteries. Hmm, interesting things happen there. And of course we all heard about a fictional mobile phone that's getting dropped into the toilet. I don't know if that ever really happened, but there's rumors. Um, speaking of water. Um, other defects can happen with media. For example, they just break. I've seen people break off USB thumb drives from their laptop by taking them out with a little too much force and speed. Um, and yeah, those super skinny laptops, people sit on them. I don't know why. They kind of make a comfy butt sized shape afterwards. Phones do the same. So, yeah. Um, how much could you lose? It's a SideQuest drive. That's basically a plastic cartridge with a hard drive platter in it. And the rest was in a, in a, in a drive you put that cartridge into. They came in 44 megabytes, 88, and that's the latest iteration with 200. There's some conference videos on there from 96. Probably hard to retrieve. Um, actually, this was more reliable than it sounded. But, yeah, I'm glad we don't have to use those anymore. Magnetic Fields, it's not only a great uh, album from Jean-Michel Jarre uh, from 98. I can really recommend it. Um, it's also a part of how hard drives work by applying a magnetic field. And um, there had been incidents with the Interregio of the Deutsche Bahn, the German railways. Uh, they had some fancy flip-up tables. You know those flip-up tables on the back seat, on the back of the seat in front of you? They usually have these knobs to hold them in place. Yeah, well, late 90s, it was not fancy enough to have a knob. We have niodymium magnets. They're really strong. Earth's magnets feel, Earth magnet field is about 50 micro Tesla. It's really, 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 really weak. And these magnets, they come with 1 to 1.5 Tesla. And even if you put in some distance with your laptop where the hard drive is actually mounted, that's still 20 milli Tesla. And your hard drive probably works up to 1 milli Tesla. So you have 20 times the magnetic field the hard drive could actually take. Um, that's not only bad if your laptop is on that flip-up table now, but that hard drive is spinning. So it's really making use of that magnetic field. And not only erasing your data, but also the server tracking information that your uh, read-write head needs to actually position exactly on the spot to read your data. That's, with modern hard drives, that's gone as well. Now you can really have to physically replace that hard drive because you can't even format it to put new data to lose on it. Um, actually happens. Uh, yeah, physical cold deformation, usually by high impact um, or by quickly applying um, gravity for a short time and then hitting the floor, happens. I've also seen laptops uh, getting confiscated at border crossings and you get them back with a nice bullet hole in them. Some of these agents don't know where hard drives usually are, so they shoot your display or your trackpad, but not the hard drive, and you're lucky. But hard drives with a bullet hole inside them usually are bad at giving back data. Then there's, of course, surface disintegration, meaning your hard drives read write heads, they crash into the plateau surface and mechanically scrape off the uh, metallic oxide there. It's nice if you open one of these and have like a lump of black powder in one corner. That There's your data. Good luck getting that back. And um, there's other kinds of things that can happen with deformation. Probably had a tape 
If you take it out of the drive, parts of the tape were still stuck inside it. And then you pull it out and hmm, now you have a wiggly part that you can cut out and stick and glue together. Well, that part is lost anyway. These are Sony backup drives, uh, 525 megabytes uncompressed. It's already half a gigabyte, 300 meters. Some thousand imperial units of length for lungs, I think. Um, also easy to lose. Um, people actually have their media getting stolen. Not nice people that do this. Um, or they lose laptops or hard drives. In the United States of America alone, around half a million laptops are lost each year. I have no idea how somebody could lose their laptop, but it seems to happen frequently. Uh, if you've seen, I think, last year's talk by Hetty at Camp++, Plus Plus, um, it was about ransomware. Ransomware is awesome. It makes encryption, encrypting your data incredibly easy. And encrypted data is safe. It's also safe from yourself now. And um, sometimes deletion happens accidentally. Some people manage to delete a wonderful folder by adding a surplus space character into a, an rm command at an inconvenient point. And now several folders like, oh, I want to delete all the JPEG, star.jpg or star space dot jpeg makes all the difference for your home directory please don't try that on your own home directory <laughs> um, or you try that on the wrong machine or the wrong server or as root like it happened to gitlab actually yeah very interesting um, write up on how they um, deleted a lot of data accidentally and how they worked on getting it back and what they did to prevent these uh, events in the future. Yeah, hard drives, wonderful, 20 megabytes. It's already a three and a half inch hard drive. Still an inch thick or so, wonderful. Uh, there's another kind of deletion that happens. It's on purpose. Um, it's usually more effective than accidental deletion and it's also very effective in releasing adrenaline to your body, making you highly awake in a very short amount of time. And depending if you plan to delete somebody else's data or somebody else planned on deleting your data, the effect might be slightly different, but it's still very effective in getting rid of things. Um, how much could you lose? That's a magneto-optical drive. It's somewhere somehow related to, to a DVD, but it's random access, it's extremely slow, it came in these funny cartridges like many things in the 80s came. Um, between 500 megabytes and 5 gigabytes, they're extremely reliable, so they're used for archive purposes in um, funny storage caverns. And you now have a really hard time getting a drive that can actually work with these things. So if you have a backup on there, that's nice. If you don't have a drive, it's of no use. Uh, and if you lose data, there's different kinds of loss. Let's imagine you have a laptop, it maybe has an SSD inside, maybe a hard drive as well. And what types could you suffer from? Everything's gone. You went for a swim with your laptop, your laptop did not like that. Um, you can't access the thing anymore. The device got stolen, the hard drive died, the car burned down, lightning strikes, um, you dropped it from a boat, or uh, maybe it's Hetty's laptop with the ransomware demos and something escaped from his virtual machines onto his host system. At some point that will happen. Um, you can usually remedy that by having an off-site backup, meaning another copy of your data that's not local to the place where all your data usually lives. Um, if only one medium's gone, okay, still inconvenient, but uh, if you have two storage devices inside your laptop, you can copy from one to the other. That for 
usually makes it easy to have an instant backup of a few things at least. And also that covers the window of opportunity when you're traveling and cannot access like an external hard drive or a server or the internet, just copying inside of your laptop from one device to the other or having a thumb drive on your keychain that you travel with. It may not take a lot of data, but that may be important data to you. And yeah, laptops, they die. Motherboards, RAM, CPUs, they may slowly start to fade, rate controllers. I've even seen those tiny foil cables break and start acting weird when you try to boot up your laptop. And these days also SSDs and RAM is soldered to your motherboard. So even if one thing breaks, you can basically get a new one. Very inconvenient, I think. Um, loss of integrity, that's an interesting one. Sometimes hard drives lie to you. Like, oh, I've got 512 byte sectors. No, you don't. That's 4K, actually. But you work as you had 512 byte sectors because Windows XP, XP will not work with anything else. Hmm. So hard drives lie on purpose about the data you store on them. If your file system or your operating system does not recognize that the data it got back now from the hard drive was not actually that what it stored to, you might have a problem. You've seen those JPEG files that are suddenly blocky and gray until the bottom. That's usually the result of a single bit flip. That's one bit that flipped. That's enough to ruin a JPEG. Of course, that works with any kind of data. Um, usually lossy compression is a lot more funny in the artsy effects it uh, gives you. Um, but if you start seeing um, broken image data, that's usually a good indicator that your hard drive may be failing or already has failed. Um, yeah, that's probably your desired goal, getting a restore from that data you have. Um, you need some testing, of course, and also you need to think about what do you want to restore. Just a single database record? Doesn't help if I have a copy of the whole file. At least it makes it a lot of more work. Uh, a calendar event from your calendar? A single contact inf piece of contact information? Does your software work with that? Can it do that? Think about it. Do you need it? Maybe. Other media. Jazz cartridge. Mid-90s, one gigabyte, two gigabytes. Similar like the Cyquist cartridges, it's hard drive platters in there. These were actually very cheap drives, but expensive media, and the media was artificially aged. After some years, they refused to read the data, even if the physical device was okay. Interesting impact, no? If your data just says, well, I don't give it to you. I don't want to. My manufacturer said I should be broken now to, buy, to get you to buy new ones. Happens. So, what could possibly go wrong with all that stuff and thoughts about data? Well, pretty much everything, seriously, everything can go wrong in this uh, scenario. You may have empty backups, like backing up to Defnal, or a hard drive that's actually not plugged in or powered up. I've seen those. Um, having a wrong device configuration or a path gone wrong your data does not actually end up on your backup media. Happens. When do you find out? Yeah, you might be backing up in the wrong direction and overwriting your original. Hmm, interesting one, yeah? Um, unreadable backups, especially if you do to CDs or DVDs, optical media. Um, optical media is actually several layers glued together. Like you have a polycarbonate layer, that's the thick one that mechanically holds it. Then there's a thin uh, layer of metallic uh, put in there. And then there's a covering sheet and some, some artwork on it. Um, that glue that's used there is actually biodegradable. And there's bacteria and fungus that feed on that. So if you don't have a properly dry and dark place to store your media, it might actually get eaten by bacteria. Um, so check if your 
uh, storage place where you have where you put your things is actually okay. Um, that backup media may be unretrievable, like I have no clue where it is. I have had that happen. So make some kind of list, have an index where the things are. Um, your backup medium may be large and quick, but the device you want to copy from is actually too slow. So your backup starts writing zeros because tapes actually need a constant rate of data to flow in. And if that doesn't, isn't fast enough, um, you might have, uh, run into a problem. Uh, then, of course, there's credentials. Um, if you have a backup and it's off-site, you probably need a password to access it. Do you know that password by heart? Can you look it up somewhere? You use a password manager. That is great, which means you now have a 64-byte randomly generated password. It's secure. It also will keep you out of your data if that password manager file is in that backup. Don't ask me how I know these things. Um, you've also synced your password manager to your mobile phone. That's great. Unless your bag got stolen while traveling. No, both are gone. Um, and then you think, well, I've got some cloud backup. I can restore it to my phone and work from there. And then you find out that your password manager application is actually not on the App Store available anymore. Then you get it somewhere else from the interwebs, maybe a backup from somebody else, and find out that this is a newer version that cannot read your database file format anymore. So hmm, might still be somehow inconvenient. Um, of course, we use SSH and GPG keys. These are important things, at least to me they are. Um, do you need a key to access your remote backup over SSH? It's great when your private keys are in that backup as well, encrypted of course, but you might have a bootstrapping problem there. Um, your keys have passphrases, of course you know those by heart, unless they're in your password manager, you know where this is going. Um, and physical media is also very convenient to have because you may be able to restore it very quickly unless you have a new laptop that you had to buy because your old one broke down. The new one only has USB-C connectors and your hard drive is maybe Firewire or USB-A. Now you, it's Saturday afternoon, you need to get an adapter. Shops are closed already, at least in some countries. Um, some of these laptops only come with a single USB-C connector, and that's all they have, and they use it for power. So even if you can connect your hard drive to restore the data, you either need to go through in, on a single charge, so your laptop needs to run and power that hard drive as well, and, or you need another kind of adapter that you can plug in between to power it up. Of course, that adapter is not available in the shop, and it has to be ordered, and it will arrive in two weeks. Hmm. Optical media. They later came in three and a half inch as well. Looks like a floppy, but it's actually some kind of CD, DVD-like storage medium. 230 megabytes. Hmm. They were easy to lose, coming smaller. Um, capacity. You had a one terabyte hard drive in your old laptop. The new one's shiny and flat and thin and all fast. And it has a 256 gigabyte SSD because they're charging astronomical prices for larger capacities. So can you restore a part of your backup or does your software say, well, it's either everything or nothing? Some manufacturers lap, um, backup software actually has that problem. It won't restore, let you restore parts of a backup conveniently to smaller media. Um, and of course, copying 500 gigabytes or so may take some time. Um, same for copying from a NAS from a server on your local network. Gigabit Ethernet is fine. If you have Ethernet on your laptop or at least the necessary adapter to get Ethernet on your laptop. Uh, if you don't, well, use Wi-Fi. Where's the Wi-Fi password? Mm -hmm. I see smiling faces. You've listened. 
um, no problem. I've got physical access to the router. I can reset the password. But there's the admin password of the router. And since it's not admin admin, because it's my own network, I keep that secure. Hmm. I can reset the whole router and start from there. But where's my VLAN configuration now? So, yeah. These things may get annoying at a very inconvenient point in time. We've already heard the things about RAID controllers and having firmware issues and things that um, break. Um, partitioning schemes, master boot, good old master boot record and GPT are fine. Some proprietary RAIDs use a master boot record partition and then put their own things in there that no other software can read. So that might be inconvenient as well. Same goes for file systems. Your new operating system may not be able to read that other file system because you switched platforms or it got deprecated. Some things don't support UFS or ZFS or X something or is Riser still a thing? Yeah. Hmm. There may be there, there may be things you cannot read for some other reason. Um, or you have some proprietary cards. This is an Olympus card that was used in digital cameras. You cannot even get a card reader to put those in anymore. But there may be some very important pictures on them you want to get. Um, and then you find that old card reader with that old USB port and now you're searching for a micro or mini USB cable that you use a USB-C adapter with to hook up to your net. You see where this is going. It can be really annoying. Um, and there's the old thing with operating systems. The new hardware is not supported by the operating system you were actually running before. And um, your old backup software may be 32 bits and the new operating system only supports 64-bit applications. Some proprietary manufacturers actually deprecate 32-bit software. And now you have a backup, it's good. You have a laptop, it's good. But your software won't run anymore. Was convenient at the time. Um, or you run into issues with some um, legacy applications that you must run. And they're compiled against some ancient version of glibc. And yeah. Don't even think about switching hardware platforms or architectures from x86 to ARM or RISC-V in the future. Ransomware, we already had that. And um, the integrity of bit rot is always funny. File systems. Some file systems support compression, like on the fly, instantly. ZFS is uh, a major candidate for that. And when you copy that data back, it gets uncompressed, meaning it uses more data, more space, maybe more space than you have on your destination media you want to copy back to. Um, compact flash cards, always nice. Maybe they were in your router, they maybe they were in the camera. They may run FAT12 or FAT16 file systems that some things cannot read anymore, let alone format. Um, and these small cards actually came as hard drives as well. IBM Microdrive, one gigabyte, actually physically, mechanically spinning hard drive that size. Incredibly unreliable. Um, but they were cheap. And of course, the usual problem with proprietary software. Of course, we'll try to avoid that. Many of us try to avoid that. But sometimes you're finding out that the tool you used is not packaged anymore for your new shiny CentOS 7, because you came from CentOS 5, and the maintainers are gone, and these things happen. And as a last uh, motivating look out into the future of your own backups and restore adventures, your PC might now be bo booting up using BIOS. Some may be using UEFI already. Um, come 2020, new PCs will only boot UEFI. So if your legacy operating system that you use for that medical application that you're legally required to run and you absolutely must not change anything of that running setup because you will lose uh, the legal grounds to use it on patients will prevent you to get new hardware to run that on. 
I have seen things. Um, so. Intel announced they will deprecate BIOS booting hardware. And as I said, don't even think about switching to ARM or RISC-V. That might become interesting. So how much time do I have? Uh, minus 10 minutes? Minus 5? Minus 2. OK, minus 2. So I can go to minus 10. OK, I'll do that. I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, so uh, what helps in somehow taking care of your data? A backup concept. My recommendation is having one. It's quite easy. Um, you've seen what to avoid. So if you don't make those mistakes, you should be good. Uh, there's the uh, usually easy 3 two, one rule. Data exists when is, there's three copies of it, two local and at least one externally. And using generations, meaning recent data gets back up more frequently and kept for some amount of time. And the farther away the past goes, um, you have a backup that's OK, one week, granularity, or maybe a month, and maybe something older. There's a question. In the 3 to 1 rule, is that uh, it has to be at least on three of the three backups need to be on two separate distinct technologies. So, like oh. distinct mediums yeah. or. Mm -hmm. that's, that's also a good approach, yeah. I, ca I can get behind that. Um, generations, we had it. Test your restore. Testing is annoying. It usually takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of work, it may take some hardware to actually try to restore to, um, but you don't want to end up backing up to def null for some time. There's always space free there, but um, it may take a little longer to restore that or back that up. And that is actually a photo of the cache device used for the tape libraries you saw earlier. And it also helps to automate your backups, because if they're not automated, they won't happen. And uh, please test again. That also helps. And do a full disaster recovery from literally zero that you want to cover. Because bootstrapping with the typo um, is actually hard. Close your laptop, start with the backup medium alone, and try to get back to a running system where you can access everything you need. You might find out that you have a great backup solution and a great concept, and some tiny bit in your bootstrapping process is missing a passphrase that will make you lose all the data instead of getting it all back. So, you can count how many bytes you could lose with that one. Um, questions? <laughs> yeah, for bootstrapping, uh, I also found it convenient that if I do this bootstrapping test, then it's a great way to actually document the way to restore because, yeah, you set up your whole automated system and because it's automated, mm -hmm. you won't remember it in four years. Yeah, it's something on Amazon S3, but how, how do I access that and what? So this way, because I was forced to document each step, I needed mm -hmm. to go through all the steps, and then in the end we had a we had a document which could be distributed to everyone, so that there is no single point of failure. Yeah, that's the guy who knows how to restore backups. No, no everyone knows how to restore backups. Okay. Is that on the recording? It is on the recording. Okay, so don't need to repeat it. Yeah, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, I might add to that. Uh, have a print out of that documentation, because if that documentation resides on your NAS, it might not be accessible because that's what you want to restore. Um, yeah, but um, that's a good recommendation, document that. But we all know documents. Documentation is an illusion. Obviously. Further questions? Last one. Well, I think uh, the time is also important. I had backups from uh, Oh, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I can't read them. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's uh, hardware uh, defect on, on the medium. Sometimes 
you just can't read them because you don't have the, the hardware to read it. The yeah. hardware with the running software. That's, that's exactly right. So uh, I think the most important uh, documents we have, we should them, we, we should them back up very often, every two or three years, mm -hmm. on a mostly secure uh, medium. Well, not, not uh, big amounts, but, but there are many uh, things you don't want to lose. Exactly. There, there might be small amounts of data that are very, very important, like, for example, your private key pairs yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And so uh, the, the amount of time between your backup or archive solution is used and the time you want to restore may affect if you can actually access the physical media and also if you can read the file formats, especially if they're proprietary file formats, there may not be software available or operating systems available that can actually run that software or you even don't have a copy of that software anymore. So yeah, that's an important thing to think about as well. And I think we're done. Thank you very much.